Yo, here we are. Weed for the people podcast episode uh, five. <clears throat> Lost count there. Anyway, shout out to Cannabis Capital for having us. Uh, we got a great guest today to uh, continue on with our tradition. CEO, co-founder, friendly. Uh, Darren here is with us. I'm going to do a little intro like we did last time. And then we're going to uh, jump into some questions. Um, you know, look, by the time this thing airs, I'm actually, we're doing this one early on a Wednesday. Normally we film on a Thursday, headed up to Watsonville uh tonight uh, we're gonna open that store friday want to give a big shout out to the city of watsonville for being the easiest city that we've ever worked for there's been a few good ones along the way uh you know really like bellflower some other ones were pretty easy um and i want to touch on a, a subject that is what i call the hidden tax right so you know we've put out you know we're gonna open a lot of stores this summer you know the dates are getting pushed a little bit but they're almost there so we should have seven openings this summer what a lot of people don't realize is you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Those are getting pushed forward for two and a half, three years. And just want to drop a couple examples of how these things get really hard. You know, Oxnard, we've had that motherfucker built since like fucking November, right? So they required fire sprinklers in a strip mall. Makes no fucking sense. Fire department itself says it makes no fucking sense. That we've been fighting over the engineering that goes through the parking lot. Long story short, we've lost fucking damn near nine months by the time we open. Hopefully we get that open in the end of July. And, you know, I think it's 150 K to put in the sprinklers. We had a fight over the engineering. They don't care. They just have to spend 400 K. There's a reason, by the way, I don't want to say too much. There's only one fucking store or two stores open in Oxnard. Uh, we're getting there, but ours was an extra long run. And again, this is just the hidden tax. How much hundreds of thousands of dollars, not only on the sprinklers, but in rent have we spent getting through that? And then the prize you get when you open 250k opening fee i can't complain too much because we signed up for it but in no other industry the day you open the door you got to cut a quarter million dollar check and you know for a 1600 which is i think the smallest store that we've ever built i think it's going to go down as the most expensive store especially when you throw in the 250 the fire sprinklers i can go through the whole thing they want us to light the entire strip mall costa mesa has actually been a fairly decent city to, to, to work with again that one's pushed to july it's been fully built out for about a month month and a half now ADA issue has come into play. And this is building again that exists. We're only taking one suite. So look, we want everybody who's, uh, you know, has an ADA issue to make sure that they can get in and access it. But again, they overkilled it. Uh, the owners weren't really big on it. They had to get gamed up a little bit. My thing was like, yo, let's just do it. Try to fight it off later. So we're working on that. And, you know, look, state licenses now. They require CEQA. I was laughing. I'm reading the paper the other day. You know, Newsom is trying to get rid of it so they can build more housing. So we have a housing crisis here. They realize CEQA is just a total log jam. And the weird thing about cannabis is you just have to get the exemption. So it should just be a check mark, but that slowed down the state licensing another couple months. And I could go on and on in specifics, but, you know, California, not only is it probably the worst place in the world to do sell cannabis, um, being the cannabis industry, it's literally, you know, I haven't done too much work in other states, but it's got to be the top few. It's almost uninvestable, uh, to quote Mr. Wonderful. I see him talking about it. And it's just so hard getting through all the red tape of the city. We're about to open another one in LA after Watsonville, which will be open. You know, another very tough city to, to work in. You got to get all the DCR approvals and everything else. So this is the invisible tax. We all know the 40% tax is really high, but most of these build outs, you know, like the one in Watsonville, you know, we, we probably built that out for a third of the cost of what a regular build out would be, uh, you know, a regular build out. Why? Because the city's business friendly. They didn't jam us up with a bunch of stuff that, you know, it's safe. It's going to be fine for the, the, the customers and the patients and everything. And at the end of the day, that's the way these cities need to do fucking business. But for whatever reason, they've overhired. You got to check every fucking box in the book to get one of these things open. So I am proud. You know, the dates are getting a little push. We should have one in June, quite a few in July. I'm calling it the summer of catalyst at the office. I call it the summer of pain, but because, uh, you know, we can't staff up before we open them or, you know, our cash flow is going to be in the wrong place. And this is what we have to deal with just to get an open legal cannabis dispensary. It's all the red tape and then the taxes that uh, come with it. You know, one little announcement, we'll see by the thing this, this uh, by the time this thing drops, you know, we did the whole glass house thing, which we're going to touch on uh, while we're here uh, chatting it up with Darren. Uh, it's kind of some interesting math. I didn't expect it maybe to go around uh, the circles as much as it did. And I do want to say one thing that I think is important to be said, you know, Kyle always treated me with respect. We've had a lot of different meetings. You know, we never got down to a place where I felt like, you know, as an ideology, as a philosophy, we wanted to carry 
carry their product. So, you know, kind of always was, was preventing me from really going on the attack on Glasshouse. Again, look, we know there's a lot of companies out there that are backdooring on a small scale, but they're doing it on such a large scale and they're out there as the face of compliance and they're out there in Sacramento and they're actually setting policy, like right now, setting policy and these are policies that benefit them. And then I know a lot of other companies, guys I like that I won't say, that I know we're under investigation. So they're picking and choosing who to put under investigation. They're turning a blind eye to, to, to Glasshouse. Now, look, the system is broken. So we all know that the system is broken. To me, you know, if you're back during 20, 30%, if they lowered the tax base, they could get rid of the burner distribution, you know, pressure relief valve, and you would, you know, double or triple your revenue. And it would be fine, right? Glasshouse is a unique case because, you know, whatever, if it's 60, 70, 80, I don't think it's very disputable that they're backdooring that much. And then they're adding another million feet of canopy. And it's like, yo, bro, you don't get to put up a bad business model and then be rewarded by basically backdooring with plausible deniability everything out the back, especially when you were enforcing cannabis laws is, is uh, you know, a police officer when you came up. But I do want to say this because I think it's an important thing to say, uh, you know, as a person, have no issue with Kyle, always treated me with respect. We had a lot of different meetings. I'm not a lot, but a handful of different meetings, you know, same, same thing with Graham, but like in anything else, right? Mark McGuire, very nice guy, ended up being the hitting coach for the Dodgers, but he was taking steroids. Those records shouldn't uh, count. And when you're pushing it that hard and you're really part of the system that's created the problem and you're engaging in cronyism, you know, that's when we call it out. And I'll be honest, a little of me is like, okay, your guy is engaging in, you know, whatever it is, 60, 70, 80% black market activity. I tend to think it's more towards the higher. They know they have the numbers, they have the metric. So, you know, metaphorically, if you got to put a gun in somebody's mouth, that's what you got to do. So that's my little intro rant. I could go on and on. By the time this thing's there, shout out to Watsonville for being a cool ass city to work in. Met some cool partners there. Um, you know, Mark Weedman, he was on me 24 seven to try and uh, make a deal up there, which we did. And look, we're not here to like make too good of a deal for Catalyst and any deal we do. Uh, we always try to bring more value than we're going to get out of the deal. So we're super excited to open there in Watsonville. It's going to be a, a good summer uh, for Catalyst, but enough about us. We got Darren here from uh, Friendly On. I'm going to start popping off some questions and, uh, you know, we'll get into some fun topics, uh, fun or interesting topics, uh, as they say. And look, Darren, like everybody else, just barely getting by, uh, you know, trying to find his way, you know, with some bloodbath out there. But I think what, uh, and I actually read an article, I think it was yesterday, and uh, where they said the small farmers maybe are, are winning, right? Where they're 54% of the marketplace, you know, who knows how they get these statistics or whatever. But I do think there's something to have been small. I think personally, the worm has turned and a big part of what we're doing here, whether we get huge viewership or not, we want to make sure that we're uh, telling the stories that need to be told and uplifting, you know, the smaller craft farmers that really the culture and the industry is built on. So, uh, you know, with that, I want to welcome Darren and I'll kick it off with just a question of, uh, you know, how we got, how do you get into the industry and, and what's the history behind that? And, you know, from, uh, you know, either 215 or the start of Friendly Farms, you know, what's your history in cannabis? Give us a little bit of, uh, about that. Fuck, man. It feels like a whole nother lifetime, like what it's been to where we're at now. Um, I, I started in cannabis when I was 18. I was selling cars. I had my first son when I was 18 years old. So to provide for him, I was detailing, got into uh, detailing cars, then got into car sales and just couldn't make enough money to like support the fam, you know? So I started selling weed just on the side, um, selling to like people at the car dealership. I was working with different farms up in uh, Placerville. I'm from Sacramento. So a lot of like old school, like hippie growers, like cats that would be in L uh, Oakland all the time and finding newest, like some of the old school strains that back then were obviously like all the new shit. So like Odyssey and like strawberry cough times deep chunk. And like, I'd go to buddy's crib and just like, it was crazy to be a part of that side of like, just, I think I was using bud trader to like meet different growers back then. I don't know if you're familiar with that website, but it was just like the Craigslist of like black market weed. So, or 215 weed, whatever. So, um, I met, uh, this dude, Steve out there in Placerville got into just like breaking down eighths and half ounces and shit, like in the trunk of my car after work and got an opportunity to work at a dispensary in Eastside San Jose. So was managing a shop out there doing the purchasing and stuff when I was like 19 years old, bro. And, um, from there just like got into cultivation, 
um, got into cultivation, growing on like garages or across the city of Sacramento. Um, all indoor stuff, never did. I did like a little greenhouse in my backyard once, but that was a motherfucking, that was a trip. Um, but yeah, man, so started uh, started on that side and got into even like open blasting. Like there was like this huge wax situation that came up. Like we were taking hot dabs and fucking uh, coughing our lungs out and shit. But when nobody knew what we were fucking really smoking at that point, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, but yeah, I mean, dude, I've been from, you know, just selling weed to growing weed, extracting weed, and then started a delivery service. I was working with a lot of people back then um, from different areas, and it just became too risky working with just whoever and wanted to control like my own supply chain of like, if I'm cultivating it and I'm manufacturing little shit on the side, then I want to be able to sell direct to customers. So I started a delivery service uh, back in 2014. Ran that for about three and a half years, got up to like 70 employees. We lobbied the state for non-storefront licenses because back then that license type didn't exist. It was just all retail. So we were in there uh, with ease. We hired a lobbyist. But when we were in the state capital, because like I said, I'm from Sacramento. Interesting. I'm yeah. on my ADD show right now. Huh? Um, just rocking. You know? Yeah, just popping. <laughs> um, but no, so we um, had hired a lobbyist and started an association so that we could lobby for the state to have non-storefront delivery licenses. And um, it it took maybe a week and we were in like the governor's office like first week. So it was like kind of a trip, bro, to go from like all black market weed shit to like wearing a suit and going to the Capitol and just like talking about policy. Um, at that point, I had delivery in Sacramento, East Bay, uh, down in Escondido, we had hubs and so, um, we ended up being like the, the the company that the state worked with to create what regulation could look like, whether it was the pizza delivery model or um, just like the the hub and spoke model of having like a case on you at all times and just right. deliveries as they came in. And so, um, so yeah, man, went from delivery. That's where I met my business partner, Chaz. He would always come in, fucking, he would vend me some of like the most fire weed uh, this Doug's Diesel, which we actually ended up extracting and winning high times back in 2018. Um, but it was a Rascal OG crossed with New York City Diesel. And it had like, it was so fired. I always like have to talk about what the bud looked like because it was so beautiful. But um, like purple tint with orange hairs, fucking, uh, I don't even know the flavor was insane. But um, that's how I met Chaz. Me and him were always bullshit. He'd come in, sell me weed. Um, always had really good weed for a pretty solid price and he had an opportunity to get into uh, the extraction game and so went down met some people out in uh, Santa Barbara actually some of your like good friends <laughs> and uh, all good that's good yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no so we picked up uh, initially it was like all trim and I'm like he came to me with this opportunity of like dude I got this opportunity to get in like extraction I know these big growers um but I need a patient list. And I had like 10,000 patients or some. So um, I was like, word, like I'm in. I had built this business with the delivery. We had up to 70 employees. Um, it was a monster, but it was a lot to manage. Like retail specifically, like when you look at delivery, your cost per delivery is like what hinders your ability to grow. And then having so many different options as like, you know, I mean, even back then there was a million brands and a million different like right. vendors, but that was the day where you wanted to meet vendors, bro. Like it was cool to meet like the new dude who had like the new right, different right. type of weed and stuff. And now it's like, there's so many brands in the state that. I heard something like 20,000. And dude, then that's you, crazy. we're going through this because it makes the purchasing so hard and we try to balance. So we have about 150 brands. It's like 2000 SKUs though. And so we were literally talking about this yesterday and the balance of like, we probably got to get it down to 120 brands and you hate to see 30 go, but it's just as easy to order a hundred of, you know, 10 different SKUs as it is 20 of 10 different SKUs, right? Or five of 10 different SKUs. And then it's this, you know, we want to see the craft farmers do good. We want to give everybody a chance. And then, you know, purchasing is always looking at me like, what the fuck? Cause I'm always trying to give somebody a, a shot. So we have to balance like, you know, abusing our own staff, so to speak, mm -hmm. versus like how many brands can we hold on our shelf? But to your point, They've been uh, coming out of the woodwork. I'd be curious to uh, ask you, and then, you know, again, same thing, you know, there's so many good brands from Humboldt, like how do you decide or anywhere really, um, but especially the Emerald Triangle where the culture is built, you know, how do you get them all on? 
And if there was, you know, if I could snap my fingers and do it, it would be the greatest wish that I could ever have, you know, what, you know, as far as business goes, uh, you know, granted, but it's just, you know, at some point it, it, it gets difficult, but we try to balance that and be about the small craft farmer with like, Hey, you know, we run a small staff too. We can't have 500 brands. Like, I don't know what the right amount has. We can't have 10,000 skews. Dude, it's all about the right brands. Like what makes the right brand? That's really the question is like, how do you find a brand and say, I'm going to bring it on my shelf. Right. And, and there's been, like, there's been sleepers like, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that maybe I didn't like, oh, you know, we'll see. And then, you know, I'll look at it and there's been some that have come on really strong that, you know, had a muscle their way on there and they yeah. were persistent and, you know, they, they did end up popping. I want to ask you, so how was it? Uh, I didn't realize you lobbied with ease. Yeah. You know, pretty interesting. Well, and not with them. It was more against because <laughs> they had their model. Oh. We were, had our model. So well, again, like we were for the small businesses so that we could stay alive in that time. And ease was like, uh, well, you have to be attached to a dispensary or, you know what I'm saying? So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, so the case size is a big thing. They actually came out with some num new delivery re regs and I don't want to get too wonky and, and lose the audience yeah. here, but while, while it's, while, while it's, while we're there, um, you know, the case size now is 10,000, which is kind of interesting. Right. Um, and you know, I think ultimately where it goes is the cities, like, let's say you're delivering from a city with no tax, San Francisco, which happens, and then they just, you know, drive the truck down and they must park it somewhere and they deliver into Long Beach, they're not paying any tax. So, uh, oh, okay. which is fine and all, but they're getting an 8% uh, advantage. So I think what they're going to try to do is apportion the tax is I think where they're um, going with it. But as, as far as like, you know, so with the small delivery versus ease, the large delivery, by the way, you know, whatever, shout out to anybody doing anything, but I know the delivery companies because of the cost to deliver in a high regulatory environment, super hard to turn a profit, almost Dude, yeah. impossible, right? But, you know, what was your differences at that time as far as policy was concerned between what you guys were trying to push as your delivery company versus what Ease was trying to push? So back then we had we really just wanted to push that you didn't have to be you could be standalone. You didn't have to be attached to a dispensary. Right. right? You had to have your own infrastructure. Right. You had your own um, availability to deliver. I guess like we were in Sacramento, Fremont. Um, and down in Escondido. So like we played with different models. Like that's where I learned a lot about business actually was like running this delivery service because it was like, how can you get your price or cost per delivery down? And I would look at margins and then I'd have to flip that shit on its head and be like, well, fuck the margins. Like it's all about what's your profit per delivery. I can make a 70% margin, but make six bucks or I can make a 20% margin and make 40. You know what I mean? Like what's going to be, what, what's going to be sustainable as a business owner. And so actually learned a lot about business through delivery. And like, I was talking to uh, June from Nabis, I think like a couple of days ago, and he was like, asked me something about delivery services. And I was like, dude, I don't see how you can survive as a delivery business. Like, I don't know anybody who's like on their shit that can like, like the, if you're small enough, and that's, I think what it goes for in all of California, right? If you're lean enough and you run your business tight and you know your numbers, that's how you can exist, right? Regardless of like, how big or how small you are and what happened like during COVID with this huge like inflation of like consumers and uh, people having money to go buy shit at the dispensaries as everybody got crazy, like store owners and store managers and the whole shit just started like booming. So in their eyes, like instead of staying lean, they're like, let's try to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but not being smart about like how you manage that growth once it got back to like reality then people just started falling off. And in delivery, I think it's, I mean, everybody starts a new business too, right? So there's new licenses constantly coming up in territories that there's really not even the population to potentially support, right? Unless your business model is completely different than what like your whole, that whole market looks like. So, um, no, I think that's one of the themes of like the people that are still around that have survived is right sizing the growth. And, you know, I said this before, some people built to get to Mars and they don't realize like, yo, bro, you're living in 1960, like you might make it to the moon. Mm -hmm. And so, and then their model was, Hey, we're going to grow into this. So what's happening out there right now is the debt bubbles coming and like, you know, we never really had the big money, but all the big guys that were relying on, I'm taking another 20, I'm taking another 50, you know, they're, they're getting busted out. And to your point during COVID, like those were the, you know, as far as sales, obviously, you know, it was a tough time for, uh, you know, everybody else, but in the cannabis world, just speaking business, you know, people were, you know, cracking sales left and right. And I've yet to see a delivery model that is on scale 
that's super profitable maybe one day uh, i mean logistics is a motherfucker right like you got to really have enough customers to warrant being able to like spend have that overhead like and I mean, that's why we don't delivery. i mean we have one social equity one that we do uh for uh, a, a gentleman who's in the social was looking to try to get in the social equity program and since we had four licenses in long beach you know we, we set him up with one and you know gave him a little wind at his back again he's just barely struggling to keep his head above water too as is everybody else for that matter right so it's not uh unique you know he's putting in putting in the work it's just a super hard thing but we personally never delivered for that reason it's a whole other model and it's like dude we just don't have the money you know to get into you know delivery and, and do the whole thing let me ask you about the product itself mm -hmm. um you know i think uh you know we talked a little bit off camera uh one of the pioneers of uh you know ma uh, making live resin and you know high-end high quality product uh you know give me a little bit of your process how you collaborate with different farms yeah, and for sure. you know how, how you uh, you know how you go about making the product and then who you determine who you're going to collaborate with and you know what differentiates you from you know some of the other products in the marketplace yeah so uh, we became a brand in 2017 and back in 2017 we had launched at Blazers Cup uh, back in I think it was October and we had collaborated with Connected. So that was like our first introduction as like being a brand in the extract world. Uh, we, we were only producing live resin at the time. And we won, I think, first and sixth place with like Gushers and Biscotti. And um, we got into that because we were bulk selling initially. But that was like a race to the bottom. And I saw that I was like, there's no sustainability in this model of like only bulk producing. So we started focusing on the branding, went through a couple of rebrands. Um, and back in, and then in November happened to stumble across like our live resin extract that wouldn't solidify or wouldn't crystallize and wouldn't sugar up. So it was like all liquid. So I go to the facility and I'm like, my partner hits me up. He's like, yo, D like this shit is just all liquid. Like it's not turning into sauce. And we happen to have like some carts there at the lab. And I was like, dude, let's fill one of those carts, try it, see what it's like. And, um, we had not separated like any compounds. We weren't doing anything intentionally, right? Like this just kind of like happened. And so um, we filled a cart and it just tasted amazing, right? It just tasted like straight weed. I forget what strain it was. I want to say, fuck, it was like cherry limeade or some shit like that. Um, but super terpy. And like, like I said, I was in delivery for a while. So I was working with like Kingpin. I was working with Brass Knuckles. I was buying absolute extracts. Like Select came into California and like just that dude Eliov just fucking smashed me with product. So like, um, they're like gone I, now though. Huh? <laughs> I said Select is gone now though. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. An example of the bubble and not being able to lean out right, right. in the market. But, anyways, so, um, yeah, let, yeah. Let me let me ask. I'll, I'll just kind of follow up on it. So, um, like generally, you know, and look, I respect anybody's hustle. Whatever you're bringing to the market, uh, you know, it's, it's your right to do that and hustle it up how you want. Um, you know, so you know these pins that are being made with you know distillate terpenes, and you know basically being put back together. Um, why do you think you know a what makes uh, you know your product superior, and b why do you think the consumers are still drawn to that, especially as the pricing seems to be getting closer and closer, um, you know, from where I sit, and, you know, it's like you get a little more dabbling into the vape side and, you know, get, get, you know, switch it up with the flower. Uh, you know, I do not have a distinguishing palate, but I fucking taste the difference. Like easy, yeah. easy, like good flavor goes down nice. It's a whole difference. You know, a, what is the difference? And B, you know, wh what do you think the consumers, if we could guess, I don't know, where do you think the consumer's head's at as far as like making that transition? Do you see that market uh, space getting bigger? I think like what we saw a lot of when we first came out with these carts was that we were pulling flower customers into vape because people that smoke that were vaping, there was like when we were at these shows and we're like showcasing the carts, most people didn't want to try them because they were just like, I don't, I don't do that. Like they know what it's about. Like that was like, I think the first uh, vape was like the clear, which that shit tasted just like super sweet. I remember trying like the blue raspberry and was like, dude, this shit is fucking good, but it's weird, you know? But if you like weed, then that's kind of like what we started to see a lot of the consumers would, would, would gravitate towards our product. Um, 
but I think there's, I don't, at this point, I don't think there's a lack of education. I just think there's like, I won't say that. I think there's access to education, but I think that the general like knowledge and, and level of like education for the average consumer isn't there to know like realistically what they're smoking. If they've never smoked weed before and then they smoke a cartridge, whether it's CO2 or just a distillate with terps. Um, and nowadays, fuck, everything is called live, right? You could take distillate put fucking 5% live terps in it and call it a live cartridge. So at this point, like the brands that are in the market don't necessarily make it easier. There's no checks and balances for like, I could say that my product is distillate, even though it's not, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I could say my product is whatever the fuck I want, but there's nobody saying, there's no way to even test that really. I mean, there's, yeah. You know, that's interesting because, you know, I know like, this, especially in some states, organic is, uh, you know, becoming a thing in the flower side. It's, seems to be working its way in and you know I, we had no till kings on uh last week and they're you know they're the only indoor ocal certified and there was actually some comments like you can't be ocal certified indoor and i'm like no you fucking can so i think that's what he said that's dope. um and so you know maybe there'll be a move in that way but that's really the only way and i hadn't really thought about it like you could like nobody's regulating you know what you call it right no, for sure so uh and, and, and part of what we're doing here and we were talking a little bit before you got on you know my hope is and maybe there'll be a time too you know i'm going up there to chat up uh the the bud tenders and the staff like to get everybody you know know everybody before we open a store we could tell them about what catalyst is all about what we're trying to do and just try to get to know everybody too even if it's five or ten minutes i think that interaction's you know super important as you get bigger not to lose that you know small business uh feel but we do training but what I think would be cool, and we've talked about this as bud tender training, take little 30 second, one minute snippets of this mm -hmm. and cut, you know, whatever we end up having 40, 50 guests. So they understand, you know, what it is. But, you know, I, I think that's a super interesting point I never thought of, which is you could claim it all yeah. you want, right? No, for sure. And that's like, that's what sets us apart as a brand. Like we try to be super transparent about what we've done since we've come out. Obviously, we don't talk about like all the specifics of what, like how we're extracting or whatever, but at the end of the day, the main thing that makes us different is from that time that we accidentally turned um, sauce into a liquid and started to decide like, this is like the wave because there's no other company that has this in California. There's no other cartridge on the market that tastes like weed. There's that experience doesn't exist. And then realizing that the oil was decarbed and we could put that into like edibles and um, different consumption methods. So like now we have our live carts, cured resin cartridges, tinctures, FSO, and then we did have gummies. Um, but essentially what made those products super unique is that all of them use the same oil. So it's all that unfucked with weed, just single extraction process, no separation, um, no additives, nothing like that. So just- So I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah. but would you claim that you were, uh, you've trailblazed this space for, for a lot of other brands to to come in and, and uh, you know, basically take kind of uh, what was a pioneering method and and it's becoming not totally prevalent, but slowly but surely more prevalent. You know, I'll let you, uh, you know, make make whatever claim you want to make. No, nah, for sure. But would man. you say you were the a pioneer and or trailblazer uh, in this regard as far as, you know, the, the full spectrum live resin, uh, you know, uh, pathway that wasn't really cut until, you know, around the time you were are, you're saying? No, for sure. Yeah. I mean, this was back in November 2017. Um, we had created this oil and it was just, we for sure are one of, if not the pioneer, um, just out there in the universe, right. That has created this oil. Um, a lot of other companies now, you know, they'll melt the diamonds down. You have these liquid diamond products. That's like, you're melting the diamonds down. So you're separating HTE from the crystals, you're melting those down and then you're reintroducing and creating whatever blend or ratio of like to terps to, um, to whatever you call that liquid liquid diamonds right to um to create whether it's a consistent whatever whatever the consistency is that the brand is trying to create um but we're just that single extraction process um we've never cultivated so we've always looked at collaborations with other farms i know you asked about that earlier and i yeah. kind of like fucking <laughs> jump, jump through two hoops oh, there cool, before, yeah. but, um, we always look to work with you know, small farms or farms that are pioneers in with what they've created. So like we've, you know, started out with Connected, working with Connected. We're from Sacramento also. Um, Alien Labs, obviously like true pioneers in the industry that have created 
a whole pathway for genetics that are now created like the baseline for what all other brands are cultivating right so i mean they're the um, connected you know shout out to connected you know and alien labs they're they're you know caleb that's the they're the pioneer for yeah you guys got right? history i need yeah, to think yeah, about i yeah, need yeah, to yeah, put yeah, two and two we're, together we're, right you know there, yeah. you know always you know always give a shout out to my man caleb uh you know what's cool is always been super open with information and or assistance on any big thing uh, that we ever needed. And, you know, Catalyst is really just a bastard spawn, you know, I say it, of connected, right? And had they not blazed that trail, you know, Catalyst wouldn't be what it is today. And just super cool guy, like, you know, and he, he'll say it like, I'm rooting for you. I love watching what you're doing. Fucking A, go get him. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I don't know Ted, you know, really as well, other than, you know, what I've seen online, Caleb is, you know, who I know over there and, uh, you know, just been always really supportive, a uh, cool guy. You know, there's been a moment, you know, two of us in a room, a couple of office <laughs> butted heads, but you know, all that's you know, ancient history. And, uh, you know, I couldn't say enough things about him. So I think it's cool that you, uh, did that collab. And look, even for me as, uh, you know, someone who, you know, a flower consumer, you know, just learning, uh, you know, 2017, I don't think there was as much 2018, as much education out there. And then, you know, as you know, you're, 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 you're running shops, you get a you know, little, little by little, uh, more educated in, in the product. And then, you know, you start dabbling and tasting different things. And like I said, to me, it's not even, you know, it's a, it, it's night and day, uh, kind of product tasting. Again, it's not hating on anybody else's uh, hustle, but I do think maybe those kind of more quality products are going to front run this market and the heavy marketing dollars are going to be chasing customers uh, for a while. We'll see how that break uh, shakes out. I think it will be interesting. I wanted to uh, touch on, I know you're caught up in some shit. You know, we had Darren uh, on from uh, Coastal Sun uh, two weeks ago. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk a little AR, yeah. right? So, you know, look, without knowing everything that's going on at Herbal, uh, you know, again, I, I know a few brands have left. I know a few brands have reached out. Uh, we're slowly dwindling down our AR to make sure the money pops out the other end uh, to the brands. And look, like I said, same thing. You know, Mike and, and his team was, you know, we actually went up there, checked out the facility, seeing if there was a collab or something we could do. Uh, always been super, you know, friendly. We're really uh, gracious hosts and all that. So it's just, not anything that, you know, again, I'm going to say in a, a super negative way, but I know also they were, you know, super friendly with you and, um, you know, there's an outstanding AR there. So, uh, you know, it's a huge issue in the industry. And then I've seen it happen with distributors already where I had to hold money and make sure that, that the vendors ultimately got it. I'm kind of in a similar uh, position now, but I'd like to ask you, you know, what, what your, I know you have some outstanding AR if you're comfortable, uh, talking about it and, and, you know, how's that process been? And then for a small farm, you know, those amounts are like, that could be your profit margin for the fucking six months. Uh, if you get stiffed on, you know, cause everybody's running right here. So if you get stiffed on the whole amount, you know, that's fucked up. So, you know, how's that going? Uh, you know, do you think yeah, you're going to get out I mean, alive? <laughs> what I'll say is like, it's me and, and two other owners, right? Like we're self-funded guys. We're just like, we're just cut from the cannabis cloth. You know what I'm saying? So like with where the market is and like the issues that you have with AR from like distributor or brand to retail, however, like we look at that um, supply chain, like the AR is definitely an issue. And like for small businesses like ours, working with herbal was like supposed to be a positive thing and it didn't end up turning into that. I think that just what they have as a business doesn't necessarily work in today's market. Um, but I would say that, you know, I, it sucks that we're sitting in this position because it's like, I don't know how it would be different. You know, I know that like from me being in the field and working with like retailers directly like yourselves and some of our other like main key partners in the state, that's really where we've taken the approach is regardless of like the distributor that we're with herbal, we don't have control over AR and they do AR differently. So like that was like the purpose of our transition was to take more ownership of our relationships with the stores. So at the end of the day, like know who I am, know who my people are, know who we are as like people from the industry and like our story enough to just respect us and not like buy product from us if you're not going to be able to pay or to like not be able to be consistent. And so like, that's why we made a transition. I mean, we're owed hundreds of thousands of dollars from Herbal and there's people that are owed a lot more by, from them. And at this point, I think they're just in a position where they don't even have control of their own shit, you know? But like me having a relationship with those guys and always like having open communication, I, I definitely wish that that conversation would have like happened, happened right. prior so, to me being caught up in the shit, you know? So let me ask you this, because I looked at it a little bit and I'm going to be, you know, I don't want to, 
put them too hard on blast. This is what it is. And I think these honest conversations are important. But you, well, the you, market is just going through what it's going through. So like whether it's them or all these individual brands or all these small distros, like if the stores aren't paying, everybody's dealing with it. And who knows, like they're also a huge beast that lost their biggest clients over the last couple of years. So it's just like, how do you keep that beast going, but without the same amount of revenue? Well, you know? I think sometimes, you know, and look, I don't know their whole business model, but like sometimes you got to shrink to survive for sure and then expand. And if you keep throwing long bombs and hope you get there, you're not going to get there. But you were very friendly with, uh, you know, the herbal. Well, I'm friendly with everybody. Like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So like, how does it feel? Yeah. You know, uh, and, and look, I, I get the, <laughs> oh, maybe we didn't get paid or whatever, but at some point, like, you know, the, the debt is from them. Um, you know, so you make these friends, you make these connections, now money gets involved and you're not paid. And, and I think you said something that's super on point, which is, I wish I would have just known a little bit earlier. Do you think the, uh, it's a lack of transparency, it's denial or like something more sinister or like they should have known that like, Hey, we're up against it. If we don't hit a big raise or we don't figure out a way out of this, guess what? This is where we're going to end up. Or like if the strategy is to run it all the way to the end and there's some loyalty there, you know, wouldn't it have been nice to know, you know, maybe 60, 90 days earlier that we, you know, you were headed, they were kind of headed in that direction. Yeah, man. I mean, I guess I'm like sitting here like thinking. Whatever you're comfortable I'm, with. I'm just sitting there thinking like, what what is it? And like, I can't really speculate on right. what it is. I'd uh, like to believe that like people are solid and that they believe in their business model and they, you know, saw a light at the end of the tunnel. They had conversations with people that were maybe going to give them money or they were promised that they were going to get paid or whatever. Right. Like there's a million variables. I think that's at, that are at play, but I mean, there were rumors for so long that it's like, you had to know something. If all these rumors are happening, there's a reason why those were coming up and consistently coming up. And so, um, yeah, man, it's it sucks to be looped into it. I mean, our whole strategy as a brand is to really double down with our main partners and to really focus on those relationships. And like, fuck, dude, I had to cut my business down 50 percent. So you talked about if you want to stay alive, you need to stay. You need to re reconsider how you're going to operate your business. And for us, like we had to cut down, we had to lean out. And a lot of people did. And a lot of people have been. I've talked to other business owners that are also self-funded businesses that are going through the same shit that are just like. It's just rough out there. Like, I mean, fuck, since we went herbal, my revenue got cut 60%, but we doubled store count. So like now I'm just refocusing and centering in and and uh, kind of leveling out with like mm -hmm. who we're going to work with, why we're going to work with them and partnerships are super important, right? So um, we've always had a great relationship with your team. And obviously, you know, as a self-funded business and, and as somebody who's operation like i'm involved in the weeds of the business every single day right so right. from sourcing to our retail partners to sales to marketing branding all that stuff like i'm involved in all of that so when i see catalysts bringing up people who are like fucking receptionists and bud tenders to like different management levels or director of purchasing and shit like those are the type of people that we want to work with you know like people that are like really um so most of the people, the same values, yeah, you know? most of the people you'll interface with the catalyst, you know, there's a few exceptions that came from fucking the store. Right. And, That's what I'm uh, saying, you know, yeah. uh, a, a little bit of it was necessity, but frankly, you know, as it's played out, fuck, those people are way better than, you know, bringing in the high money person from, you know, wherever fucking. So well, they America. understand the business, right? Like that's what it takes. And our industry is different than every other industry because you have to know that you have to know the industry. You got to know the culture. You got to know. 100%. Even when I have a cultural question, I'll walk in, Bree, Liz, you know, Nathan are all in one office. Uh, and Stella, who we just pulled up, I'll be like, hey, what do you think about this one? And just getting that little, you know, about, you know, the cultural feedback. And look, we always try to do right by the culture, but, you know, some of these issues are hot, but, you know, take the glass house thing, right? Like, it's, you know, where, where does that fall? Because you're, you know, we're taking public information, we're disseminating it. But you're also kind of attacking someone, and then you know there's a there's a whole tree below that that we don't want to fuck with. So let let let's get into that one a little bit. Um, that that you know I, I think is a little bit interesting if you want to you know. So you know obviously we did a little mathematics on uh, Glasshouse. You know it's our strong opinion that you know and I you know look they can claim plausible deniability all they want, which I think that would be their response if they actually responded. But for guys out there 
they were on uh, the media tour. They got real quiet, right? Uh, in fact, Bud Father, I reposted it. Fucking guy's hilarious. Shout out to the Bud Father. You're funny as fuck, dog. His memes are good, man. His fucking next level wit. But uh, he did want to just about them being silent. So, you know, you know, we put that out there. And, you know, what's your take on the overall, you know, glass house situation? Let's just assume for the sake of argument that, you know, it is majority going out the back door on an overbuilt grow. You know, how do you feel about, you know, the impact on the industry and, you know, shoot it straight. Like, do you, do you think we took it too far with them? Should people take it further? Like, you know, just. If, if you want to, you know, kind of I mean, jump in, I'm, I'm happy to hear the opinion on it because I don't think it's a black and white situation at all. Yeah, I think my perspective is like, to your point, co companies to a certain extent do have to work through the black market or they don't. But at what to, to what point are you working through the black market? Right. Like, are you expanding your business when you can't continue to sell into the market, which then just fuels the. I mean, I, I can't put my product out on the streets out here in Long Beach or wherever, right? And expect that customers are gonna go buy from Catalyst, They're right? Not. So like, if that's what you're doing as a company, I mean, dude, like I said before, like I've we've actually known Graham since 2017. Graham is a good dude to me. Like I've never had any situation with him, but as a business, when you look at that, it's like, are you supporting the legal market while uh, like writing policies and all that? Like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, I can't say that you are. But I'm also like, I'm just not familiar enough with the situation to like speak in depth on it. But my perspective is if you're fueling the black market enough to where you're like circumventing your customers from going to the stores, but we're trying to support like legal cannabis and we're trying to say, yeah, come to legal cannabis when it's like all legal cannabis has done is like backhand all of us in the fucking face, right? Yeah. Or I mean, like kick us in the shins as we're the big, by, yeah, so. Ultimately, the big problem is the... Uh, you know, the, 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 the policy, the regulation, the overtaxation, the, we get the special redheaded chep child fucking bitch lab treatment. Um, but they're an interesting case because they, they, they basically took it to, I think a level. And then people are like, where do you draw the line? I've heard that one. I'm like, I don't draw a line. I just, you know, size one up and go, Hey, I think that's too far. Right. And so that's, you know, why we, why we said something, it'd be interesting to watch it out. But basically what you're saying is you think it's an unfair business practice. Uh, we have a legal opinion. Maybe by the time this drops, maybe we'll hold it for a little bit. Then we think it's the same thing, right? And then, you know, look, I respect everybody's hustle. The hope is that they would make the legal market uh, more competitive and that like, and it's not just them. There's other companies that are, that are doing it. And then, you know, if you buy something and it authenticates and you don't have to pay the 30% tax of the register or 40, whatever the fuck it is, plus all the regulation costs that go into like, that's the hidden tax, right? So like every 30%. But by the time I have to have, you know, three compliance officers, you know, a slew of fucking lawyers go through all the, the build out process that, you know, we got into in the monologue, you know, that, that's a major pricing disadvantage. And that's like running this lean. And then, you know, all the homies that I know from fucking back in the day in Long Beach to smoke a lot of weed are like, I don't fucking buy from Catalyst. That shit's too expensive. I'm like, thanks, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Like, trust me, we used to make bigger margins in uh, 215. So I do think it's a, uh, an interesting thing that that I that, that we'll see where it goes. The hope is right that they could broaden the base for everybody. Everybody plays on a fair playing field. But I think what ended up happening, and this is the like the fix seems to keep being worse than the solution. And look, it probably helped craft farmers to get rid of the cultivation tax because that was burying them, right? Um, and so that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, what really counts in this game is how much it's being sold for in the legal market at the register price. And then how does that size up to the black market, right? And look, no no shade on the black market. All we wanna do is compete as close to an even playing field as we can. So what ended up I think happening is um, it created the situation where like, hey, we no longer have this 200 or so dollar, $225 tariff. We could blast the black market because we're operating up there in Santa Barbara, no fucking problems at all. So, you know, essentially the legal market is infiltrated the black market and look, the flippers are going to flip whatever is um, out there. And then, you know, we're super cognitive. And this is like, as this thing evolves, I'm like, holy fucking shit. There's probably a thousand hustlers below glass house that are either profiting off this, or we don't want to see them have any issue. So like, 
it's not as simple as like you know whatever shoot metaphorically shooting a few uh you know bad actors or whatever you want to call them in the head and then like the rest of the tree is going to be fine like yeah. this could be pandora's box and and we have no idea uh you know where it's going to lead and same thing like i said uh don't know graham as well but always super you know cordial you know kyle you know really really sharp guy you know we even coordinated a little bit on Long Beach politics because his 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 office is down there and my thing is like yo i just you know called it out how we uh called it out let me ask you another question uh so you know uh you said you're really trying to focus in on you know partners that 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 are you know going to be around you think or that are going to make the difference you know how do you manage to a kick open the doors and b get it so people try your product and they're like oh shit you know as opposed to another product that might be a fairly similar price point that's clearly not as good um and again respect everybody's hustle if they're getting out there getting people to buy it so it's not a i'm not trying to knock other products um you know we sell a lot of them uh so you know you know how, how, do, how do you go about that process you know what's your sales team uh like and then you know on top of that you know how, how do you educate you know because i think that is a big part of it educating the the bud tenders who you know i always say are the biggest influencers in the game yeah i mean that's a loaded question but um we've went through a ton of different sales processes since like 2018 um, just to try to find like what's the best way of working with stores. And I think the hardest thing as a brand is you have to like every retailer you work with has a different process and has a different system. But when we go in, it's always like, you know, we have, we're, we're the pioneers of creating this liquid oil. It's a, the most pure and authentic, it's the most authentic representation of the cannabis plants that we extract, right? Whether it's live uh, whole plant, fresh frozen, or if it's cured flour that we're extracting, like you're getting that same representation, um, from that, from that strain. So, um, our main thing is, dude, you, you go to the shops, you ask to talk to the buyer and you follow up, send emails when it comes to education, actually closing the door. It's like, oh yeah, I like, I'm, I've, I'm familiar with your brand. Or once you try it, then it's like, you're you're a believer right because you're experiencing cannabis in its most natural form and if you're from the industry and you know like you have some of your favorite strains you've uh grew up smoking or whatever like and we have some of the old school stuff now too working with some of the farms that we do um you're just it, it's it's a uh, fuck dude i'm lit right now from yeah. smoking this shit. Read that red <laughs> shit bro he's holding me up aside i can't read it man it's red i got bad eyes uh no cool no nathan's trying to hold me up aside and uh he's fucking got some red pen over there i can't read that fucking question uh what you got oh the rebrand i oh, got re it yeah 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 i thought it said something like that which is funny because they're trying to get anna uh to do something so let me uh and we talked about this a little bit uh you know off camera so let me ask you about the the, the rebrand uh that, that you guys are working on and i know a little bit about it but i won't uh i won't put words in your mouth or whatever or you know even even dabble in it but you know tell us a little bit about the rebrand and uh you know what you're doing with that yes yeah, so uh prior to uh, where we're at now, our brand was Friendly Farms. We rebranded, got rid of the farms. Every brand in the state is something farms, right? And it's very confusing as a manufacturing business to say, oh, we're Friendly Farms, but we don't grow. Uh, we do work with the farms. Like I said before, we collaborate and source with different farms um, across the state. But um, but we just, I decided to, I came to my partner and I'm like, dude, we're pushing this product. It's a, it's, more of a product than a brand, but we are inclusive. We're about the community. We are doing a ton of community outreach in Sacramento and different parts of the state where you're working with local businesses. And um, it just made sense for us to say, like, if we want to really like engage with consumers and educate them, because we asked about education a little bit, and it's like, how do you educate the consumer without telling them the story about what you do? Um, and just saying like what it is, because everybody can put icons, like I said before, like you can say, your product is whatever you want, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it is. Um, and I think we saw all saw that with Rock Garden, who was pushing live resin carts that wasn't necessarily live resin, right? right. So, um, so yeah, we decided to create this brand that was more human focused, more approachable for the consumer, um, that really like aimed to focus on the recreational aspect of weed and make it fun again, because since legalization and right before it was all medical right so like even if you 
just wanted to sell weed it had to be this medical positioning of like oh this is for these are the medicinal benefits and you're going to go to get a doctor's note and doctors just giving out notes to everybody right or scripts to everybody and so um we just wanted to focus on the community we want to put people front and center on the box um those people are just people we found their images online we do outreach to them ask them yo like you look like purple urkel bro like this guy right here yeah yeah there you, <laughs> you go know? that's so, dope we just reach out and we're like, uh, we like this image. We think you represent one of our strains. Uh, image of like the consumer on the front, the image of the farm on the back where we source the uh, flower from, and then flavors emojis on the side. But basically the, our whole rebrand was meant to really focus on the community aspect, bringing people together, giving people an opportunity to be a part of the of the experience, to be a part of the brand and show the ex like human experience with cannabis, right? Like people use cannabis in their everyday life for a million different reasons. So, um, no, I like that. Funny enough, they they uh, no, Bree loves you guys, by the way. And uh, I know they're trying to recruit Anna. And maybe after this, she'll uh, be like, oh, I like that fucking guy. Yeah. I'll do it because she's introverted. But once she like kind of gets to know you and, uh, you know, she likes you, that you might be able to uh, drag her in. But I do think it's important to, you know, get the day to day people using cannabis in that setting and, and uh, you know, promote the more, you know, whatever you want to call it, recreational aspect, you know, funny story kind of that goes with that. A lot of people probably don't realize this catalyst. Belmont Shore, its actual legal name is 562 Discount Meds, which is, I didn't name it, terrible name. A uh, long story on how we got it. Uh, Catalyst Cherry is Alternative Therapeutic Solutions. So, oh, so you have like the <laughs> medical names attached <laughs> yeah, yeah. to the business. So these are old medical yeah. names. The long story how it worked in Long Beach. But even uh, Santa Ana, I think, is, we've shortened it to H and HPC, but the original name is Hand in Hand patients collective i think so like yeah we get the dbas and we you know we call them all catalysts so i do think it's funny that even if you look at the old dispensary names from the 215 days they all have this like little medical kind of yeah uh, not all of them no nomen yeah. nomenclature to them so we even have some of those stores like you know if i said 562 discount meds people would be like where the fuck is that yeah it's catalyst belmont right so a uh, you know a little funny story on, on that and you know maybe after this episode uh we'll get uh canna anna to, to jump in and uh do one of these i know brie's been uh recruiting Advocating. her yeah, yeah yeah she's a big advocate for uh for you guys and uh so so i think that's cool and like you know on, on most things cultural product right you know we get a lot of opinions but you know she's kind of the you know i would say i don't want to say the final say but she's a you know a big part of that uh say i mean Let's go to the collaborations. I know you did uh, Connected in, in, in Alien Labs. Obviously, this little time has passed since then. You know, how do you decide who you're going to collaborate with? And, you know, what's the process of that? And, you know, and or like tasting the right flower that's going to translate into, you know, a, 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 a something that you can extract well. It's always been like a respect thing for some of our favorite strains as consumers. So like finding weed that we really enjoy and then reaching out to those farms and being like yo like david from preferred like this fucking snacks is fire as fuck like what's good i want to put that shit in the cart and so it's always based on we respect what they do as like cultivators or breeders or both um and we want to work with people that have created unique flavors that we feel like could be well represented in our products um and that our consumers would enjoy so like i said before like connecting the flower consumer to the vape consumer is a difficult thing to do unless you have a vape that represents the flower in its most uh, natural state. So um, that's kind of how we go about it. Like we've done work with Preferred. We have a new collaboration coming out with uh, Preferred Gardens, uh, Turtle Pie. Um, we'll be doing some stuff with like Green Dog. Uh, nice. And then we have our Casa Floor collab, which we just did a, la a big launch party. But done stuff with like Ball Family Farms. And I talk about it all the time, like we've been doing collaborations since 2017. And one of our main focuses is always to like add value to the brands that we work with. And so some of the brands maybe be from Southern California or they may be from NorCal and they don't have representation in different uh, parts of the state. And so we've had relationships throughout the state um, when it comes to like knocking down doors and like going into different dispensaries and building those relationships. Like it's all about showing up. And I've done a lot of that even once we've, opened up store doors, I've always made it a point to want to connect with the purchasing managers or owners of the dispensaries to build that relationship and, and tighten up that network. And so when we do these collabs, that's a big piece of like, we're not just slapping a sticker on a box. We're not just like buying material from them. Like we're purchasing material. We're creating a design together. 
there's like a story to tell behind the collaborations that we do and why we want to work with them. And we always get, we always work with our partners on, hey, let's get you guys in some of the doors you're not in. I had a collab with Ball Family. We didn't do a collab with them for a year. We had the box design done. We had Source. There were some issues with like, you know, we wanted the quality to be A1. And so it just took a little bit of time. But within that time, like I had opened up a ton of doors for them, op- introduced them to a lot of different uh, retailers throughout the state. And so I think it's important, like that's how we uplift each other as like people from the culture. So trying to find growers that have something unique to bring to the market that um, that belong in the stores, but maybe don't have like the experience or the knowledge or they've worked with different dis- uh, distributors um, and they don't have that focus. Their main focus is just like only growing fire product and then like the rest will come later type thing right um but that's always been like our approach is like we really do take a true collaborative approach to like our farm partners that we work with and we want to be able to add value we want to be able to create an experience and something that can be memorable for uh the customers and for even the retailers that we work with so yeah i do think we're having chris on soon i won't spoil the surprise they got some new collab strain with uh, Catalyst coming out. It's going to be fucking hilarious. They got a little picture they're uh, working on. I don't want to, like I said, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but a uh, cool guy. I've actually met him a while ago. Uh, we both went to uh, Cal, so we had that in common. And then, you know, we chatted up here and there, you know, uh, carry their product. So they're coming out with a, a cool little funny uh, collab. Dope. I will leave it vague <laughs> for now so that, uh, you know, they could have the uh, full splash of that. But I think before that rolls out in a week or two, we're going to uh, have them on and I do think there's a lot of synergy there, which is cool. And I think it also, and then like I could say, this has been my own experience. Um, and I think it's true for the customer that, um, you know, if it happens both ways, Hey, I fuck with that flower company. Oh, let me try it in the vape form. Exactly. Yeah. I fuck with that vape company. Let me try it in the, in the flower form. So I think it, it makes a national synergy. And then it, it kind of breaks down the barriers of like, I'm a flower guy. I'm a vape guy. It's like, yeah, sure, yeah, fuck, we'll do both. Right. Like it's, it, it's good. And, and, you know, from what I see, especially with the ones that don't have, you know, the fuck you budget just to go chase customers with marketing dollars, you know, 24 seven is the product first and running lean, you're going to stay in the game, right? For a long time. And I think from there, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch it, you know, shake out. But like, you know, I kind of said at the beginning of the show and what a lot of what we're trying to do here is all about is like, look, we all know there's blood in the street. We all know there's a huge debt bubble. We all know this thing's fucking food bar and the legal sales despite the fact that cities are opening up. So like in a logical world, the sales should be going up because more and more dispensaries are, are, are coming online and we see, you know, it getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which whatever, one day they're going to reform the policy. But in the meantime, the guys that are product first and running right size seem to be surviving the storm. And I think just the survival alone is going to be a big part of like, Hey, now they fixed it. Now we could, uh, you know, try to thrive. And, you know, sometimes I'll say like, look, you ain't got to outrun the bear. You just got to outrun the slower campers. Right. And that's, you know, kind of the game we're in right now. Um, let me ask you, as we're kind of winding down here on time, we finally got a fucking laptop. So I can look at the the time. I'm not guessing in my head, but, um, you know, what's the, you know, next, next year, two years look like, uh, for friendly and, you know, some of your objectives and goals or, you know, kind of, you know, final thoughts that you want to throw out to the consumers and the bud tenders. Y'all better be listening taking notes and, uh, you know, trying to uplift the brands that, you know, we're bringing on because it's something that we believe in as a retailer. Like, you know, we're not having people on that, uh, you know, we don't fuck with. So, you know, just, you know, kind of final thoughts, wrap up, which what's the objectives in the midterm and, you know, a little bit longer term for uh, friendly. I would say right now, it's just, like I said, we want to realign and refocus our efforts and energy on partnerships with the right retailers. And we really want to engage a lot more with the communities. Um, We've been doing our events that we call them Friends with Benefits pop-ups. Essentially, that's for bud tenders and for consumers to kind of engage with the brand. We'll sponsor an event in a local business. We've done a couple in uh, San Diego at Friendly Tavern. On the June 2nd, we have uh, an event at Frankie's Pizza in Old Town, Sacramento. We've done an event in Sacramento uh, with a company called Serialism. And essentially, it's like a local business collaboration where they'll host us. And we invite bud tenders and consumers to come through, learn about the brand. And it's kind of our way of like even bringing customers to these small local businesses, right? So like it's a way to really interact. So I want to really blow that up on like a macro scale throughout California. Um, 
kind of prove that proof of concept and then look to get into some of these other states that are like not in the space that California is in. And we just want to run lean here. We just want to stay, we just want to survive. We just want to, um, you know, build our market with our stores as opposed to looking to get into every door in the state. I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation and working with stores that are good actors that have the ability to expand. Like what you guys are doing is uh, super uh, dope of what of we'll see for now i'm not building in. nothing new hey. we got the seven <laughs> let me get those open and then we you know when you open them you know they're not, they ain't fucking lottery tickets and they don't shit gold so you're gonna take an l so then you know i'm like hey we ain't doing nothing more right now everybody slow it down no more hiring we got to keep it small because these seven are going to be expensive the hope is you turn them to even then make a little profit then you throw back in and you don't want to get you don't want to lose patience you know getting to where uh, you're going. So, you know, appreciate having you on, you know, we're going to wrap it up and, and look, I, I do think in exactly what you're doing is this grassroots, um, you know, call them sessions, little events. And in this game, in my opinion, the celebrities are the growers and the extractors. And I think once the customers and, and, and the bud tenders who are, have the fortunate experience of not only trying the product, but then being able to recommend it and then being in, able to interact uh, with the customer, they're basically your soldiers out there. And I think it's super important that we tell these stories and that they do get to know the history of the product, who's behind it, you know, where they're coming from. And, and, you know, like I'll finish with this and say, Hey, look, if you're, if you're at a catalyst store, you know, ask your bud tender, engage your bud tender. When you're there at the counter, we try to move that line quick. We want you to take your, uh, take your time and get to know. We hope our bud tenders are recommending products we believe in. We preach that. And, you know, uplift the small craft farmers, uplift the people that have been here, uplift the products that are, uh, you know, quality products. Obviously, you got the freedom of choice to do what you want to do. But, you know, if I have any opportunity to, to, to speak to the bud tenders and the, 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 the customers that come in, that's what I would say. And, you know, that right there to me is a big part of what Weed for the People is all about. So we're going to wrap it. Episode five. We appreciate Darren, CEO, co-founder for Friendly coming on. Weed for the people. Out. Out. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs>